Hey everyone, we have an intriguing episode today on the FinCrime Agent channel. I'm diving into the life of a public sector fraud investigator. I previously explored this role within the banking sector, but today I'm giving you a fresh perspective from a different angle. To protect our guest's identity, I'm using a virtual AI representation and voice modulation, but rest assured that every word shared comes directly from a seasoned professional with over 10 years of experience in this field. So, without further ado, let's jump right into today's video. Can you describe what a typical day looks like for you as a fraud investigator? I would estimate around 80% of my time is spent within the office, but I am also regularly out visiting domestic and non-domestic properties within the borough. I will speak to members of the public every day, whether that is with someone wanting to report an allegation, or someone we have invited in for an interview under caution with a view to prosecute. We see cases through from first receiving an allegation, to obtaining evidence, interviewing individuals, and preparing the case for prosecution. Working alongside other external agencies such as the DWP, police, immigration, and HMRC is a daily occurrence. This could be jointly investigating for separate criminal offenses, information sharing, or simply making referrals. What inspired you to become a fraud investigator in the local government sector? Admittedly, I didn't set out looking for a role within counter-fraud, it was more of a right place at the right time type situation, but as soon as I saw the job description, I wanted in. The varying work along with dealing with complex investigations, is what drew me in. I also wanted to make a positive difference to the borough I live in, which is a huge motivator for me. Can you share some examples of most common types of fraud and cases that you investigate? This definitely varies from council to council. Volume-wise, single-person discount, 25% off your council tax bill, and council tax support cases are probably the most common, but due to the low monetary value in potential savings, this is bottom of our priority list. More in-depth cases would be blue badge fraud, housing benefit fraud, business rates and business grant fraud, social housing tenancy fraud, right to buy fraud, and adult care fraud. These are the cases we prefer working on as they tend to be far more complex, and would be more likely to be suitable for prosecuting for the fraud offences. Anything the local authority pays out for, we could investigate. What has been the most challenging case you've been working on, and why? I have had plenty of challenging cases, all for different reasons, but looking back, a particular case jumps to mind. It was a very interesting and complex case which resulted in an overpayment of over £40,000. What was challenging about this is that the individual has assets and documents out of the country, and gathering evidence from other countries becomes very difficult. How has technology impacted your work over the past 10 years? Local authorities are often slow in adopting new technology, especially compared to the private sector. I think the biggest change, for my team in particular, is that pre-COVID all case files were physical files. Evidence would be printed and stored in the office. During 2020 we had no choice but to move forward with the times and store all evidence digitally. Of course, I think we all know the benefits of this, and I struggle to understand why it took us so long adopt this way of working. It's one of those local authority quirks, I suppose. What advice would you give to someone interested in becoming a fraud investigator in the public sector? I would encourage them to do so. It is very rewarding knowing as a direct result of your investigation, public money has been saved. How does the local government work towards preventing fraud before it actually takes place? Preventing fraud is difficult, especially when you consider the bare-bones funding received from central government. The reality is, there has to be a level of trust involved when dealing with council funding. We attempt to prevent fraud by delivering fraud awareness training to colleagues, in order for them to hopefully pick up on discrepancies which could potentially be fraudulent. Can you describe a time when you had to make a particularly difficult ethical decision during your investigation? I think it could be quite difficult to find yourself in that position. 
We work within legislation of what evidence we are able to obtain, usually having to justify necessity and proportionality. Whether that is gathering evidence under DPA 2018, Prevention and Detection of a Crime, REPA 2000, Fraud Act 2006, IPA 2016, Human Rights Act, and so on. What key skills and qualities do you think are essential for a successful fraud investigator? I think having a naturally inquisitive personality really helps in an investigation role. Asking that extra question, or following an extra line of inquiry, could be the difference between getting a successful outcome or not. Although not easy for some, difficult conversations and the ability to challenge people face to face is important. Lastly, unlike the private sector, there are no performance-based bonuses, so a genuine care to protect public funds is a must. A big thank you to our anonymous fraud investigator. Unfortunately, I cannot name him, but thanks for giving us such an insightful view into your profession. It's clear to me that whether in the private or public sector, fraud investigators play a vital role in protecting our financial system. Remember to hit the like button if this video was helpful to you and subscribe for more insight into the world of financial crime prevention. Your support helps this channel continue to provide more valuable content and lastly, thank you for watching. Hope you have enjoyed today's video and until next time, see you soon.